Take it away, um, Julie. All right, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of helping your garden be as fabulous as possible with the least effort and expense possible. That's what Suzanne and I specialize in. That's what integrated pest management specializes in. And the program that I work with specifically, Our Water, Our World, absolutely specializes in that. And we're being brought to you as a free webinar in partnership with the City of Sacramento, Sacramento Stormwater Quality Partnership. And my name is Julie Barber. I'll be your instructor for the evening. And I'm here in the capable hands of Lorenzo, a fellow IPM advocate. And he's going to be watching the chat function for you. So as you get questions, please feel free to ask them. Like I said before, though, he's going to answer any that he can. Some he might save for the question and answer period. And some he might just pass on for a minute, knowing that I'm probably going to get to it in a slide or two. All right, let me find the buttons. This is where I'm weak, guys. Fun on. That button didn't go next. That one almost went next. Hey, welcome. <laughs> so there's some roses. And the thing that I love about this class, especially, is the fact that roses have a horrible, horrible reputation for being profoundly needy and demanding. And we're going to show you that that reputation is not deserved. Roses are profoundly hardy. They live to make new leaf material. They live to make new flowers at all times. And we're gonna talk about mostly how to prevent the most common problems that you might be experiencing with your roses. And what we're going to repeat again and again and again until it seems like I don't know anything else to say is that when we water correctly, when we stick to organics and when we allow the native insect population to live in peace, we're gonna find out that our roses are able to withstand temporary invasions and recover from temporary invasions. And that if those problems become longer term, we need to refer back to, did we water right? Are we sticking to organics? And do we have the right beneficial insects that are patrolling that garden for us at all times? All right, so we're gonna go through an introduction to the OWL program that Lorenzo and I are with. What we base all of our work on is through the Integrated Pest Management Program. We're gonna be very heavy on pest prevention. And we're gonna talk about what you can probably expect in our area, what kind of diseases and what kind of pests. And I'd like to, it's funny, cause we always say pests, but the truth is most of the insect population is completely harmless to your plants. And in fact, if we take away too many of the insect population, we're left with more problems than ever. And you're gonna see that again and again. And at the end, there's gonna be more resources. I think we already sent some out before the webinar started and there are gonna be more again at the end. So our water, our world, every jurisdiction, every city, every county that has to discharge water has to maintain a permit. And if they don't meet the guidelines for how many parts per zillion million are allowed in the water, um, they have to do something called public outreach. And what we specialize in is outreach at the source where pesticides and herbicides are being sold. And we train the people in the stores how to recognize what a pest is, what stage of life you should be attacking it at, or just leaving it be. And there are all sorts in participating stores. You'll find these little blue tags that say eco-friendly, less toxic product. So you can start from there when you're doing your own shopping, for example. Then in the stores that we participate in, there's also always a literature rack. And now in some of the stores, there are even QR codes that you can access. But always feel free to go to the website, Our Water, Our World, and you're going to find out that there are lots of insects, diseases, pests, weeds, lawn care, excellent University of California integrated pest management information. And as someone who has spent the last, I don't know, 15 years navigating the IPM site, I much prefer Our Water, Our World. It is the exact same information, but it is paced and it is accessible. It's really usable. 
the main concern is that when we use pesticides and herbicides, the current estimate is that only half of it ever stays where we put it. So if we had aphids in our roses and we sprayed for our roses, you can count on half of that pesticide or not staying there and actually running off. And it'll either go straight down into the gutter and that usually ends up going right to the streams, rivers, marshes, and the oceans. So what you place in your yard can persist for one, two, three, four years and move 100, 200, 300 miles away from where you put it in, which means we need to be extra careful about what we're putting in our yards. And that's where Lorenzo and I live. Something that a lot of people don't know, by the way, is if it goes to a water treatment plant, these pesticides and herbicides are not filtered out. So our duty is really clear to not have these pesticides and herbicides travel. We need to find out what we're using it for, when to use it, how much to use, and we're gonna cover a lot of that today. Integrated pest management is a system whereby instead of reaching for the pesticide first, it's always the last thing that we reach for because what we find again and again is that if we didn't water correctly, if we didn't feed correctly, if we pruned incorrectly or at the wrong time, that we're actually inviting some problems. And by sticking to proper cultural controls, bolstering the health of your plant, and in this case, mostly roses, right? we'll find that he can recover, that plant can recover, because you're gonna see that a lot of the pests and diseases we talk about have a maximum time limit of maybe two weeks, and then they're gone. And roses are incredibly strong. They are not the whiny, cranky plants that I thought they were. They're actually really hardy. We're gonna use traps, we're gonna use barriers, we're gonna invite the beneficial insects, and if nothing else worked, then of course, we're gonna reach for the pesticide. And we're gonna find out by reading the package when to apply it and how to apply it so that we don't have to apply it again and again and again. So pest prevention for roses, because that's where we belong. We're gonna take care of these guys by building healthy soil, protecting the root zones with mulch. Mulch in this case is usually wood chips, anything made of an organic material that's going to lay on top of the soil to stop the sun from hitting the soil. And when that mulch is in place, your root zones are protected from extremes of heat on the surface. It's gonna hold in moisture and it's gonna prevent um, weeds from sprouting underneath. And while those wood chips break down, they're actually starting this whole process of making your soil alive again by right and fighting the right uh, fungi, bacteria, and insect world to actually work that soil for you. And so when I talk about building the healthy soil, because the soil is the home that your roots are gonna be in. And if the home isn't in good shape, the plant that you see is not going to be in good shape. So let's talk about some specifics. If this is an established rose, what we're asking you to do is every year put down some fresh mulch on top of the surface or some compost. If it's compost, maybe just an inch or so on top and you're going to lay it down. So here's the trunk of the rose and here's the furthest reaches of the branches where they're going to be. I need that compost to begin about six inches from the base of that rose plant and extend out at least a foot past the furthest reaches of the rose. The same rule applies with mulch, by the way. You start about six inches from the base and you stand out one or two feet past the furthest reaches of those branches. And when you have compost, it's going to if you need to mix it in the soil, by the way, it's gonna fix the top two problems of our soils around here. Number one, we tend to have clay around here. And I'd like to really be a voice that says clay is not bad. Just like roses are not as needy and as obnoxious as we always thought they were, clay soil is not as needy and obnoxious as we tend to believe it is. 
In fact, without clay in our soil, we have poor soil. We have soil that never lets water go through, right? So it becomes soggy, but as little as 5% of organic material known as compost mix into the soil is all you need to all of a sudden have that water pass through at a responsible rate. Likewise, if you have soil that's incredibly light and fluffy, maybe even sandy, um, adding as little as 5% of organic material, known as compost, all of a sudden that light fluffy soil will start to hold water responsibly. Compost is this miracle component that will fix just about every soil type problem you might have. And when you fix that soil type, now the roots can live in that home and access nutrition, access water, access air, all on their own whenever they need it at all times, as opposed to us rushing out there all the time in August, right? And going, are you okay, baby? It's 105 degrees out here. You must be so thirsty. But if you stick your finger in the soil, you find out he's kind of nice and moist. That's because you put down the compost. Maybe you mix the compost in and you put mulch on top. The soil is not as heavily impacted when it's 105, when we've got organic material on top and in the planting hole. Because once the soil dries out, and sometimes this happens, right? You'll find out that uh, you can add like a cup of water, right? To a potted plant perhaps, and it just plain sits there. And you work it with your hands and it gets wet eventually. We can avoid that problem by amending with as little as 5% of the organic material like compost when you originally put your plant in. And then adding compost to the surface every year and more wood chips as they decompose and break down. So as a reminder, just like I don't want compost near the trunk of the plant, I do not want mulch near the trunk of the plant. It needs to be clear about five to six inches all the way around the base. Mulch and compost hold in moisture. And if you have it next to the trunk of the plant, you're holding in moisture next to the trunk of the plant, and that's when you bring on some rot, which stresses the plant out and welcomes more diseases and more pests. Fertilizer. So roses also aren't quite as hungry as we used to think. We used to think that we had to just feed them all the time, but we have found out that they do especially well with less frequent feeding, but sticking with organic. And this is where organic fertilizers have really come down in price. If you look at the synthetic fertilizers, you're going to see on the instructions, feed every seven to 10 days. But when you look at the instructions on organics, it might say every four, five, six, seven, eight weeks. That's because when you add organic fertilizers, it's a sustained steady release, as opposed to synthetic fertilizers, which are zoom and zoom, right? Binge, purge, ah, it's just a crazy ride. But when you stick to organics, the pressure is off because it turns out you've put this into the soil and the plant can access it when it needs it. And it turns out, and you've heard me make this joke before, plants are very responsible at a buffet as opposed to some of us. And the other key to organic fertilizers is when you read the instructions, you'll find that they say it must be put into the soil. This means it won't run away into the water and it's gonna stay where you put it so your plant can make use of it. Synthetics are often put on the surface and activated with moisture, often a hose or a sprinklers and whoop, it's gone. There are some other things that roses like to have, particularly if you're putting in um, bare roots or brand new roses, it's always very helpful to put in something called alfalfa meal. It does have a little bit of nitrogen in it, but not a whole bunch. Its main function is to add these trace minerals and a certain growth stimulant hormone. And it's at such a terrifically reasonable level that alfalfa meal is released Plus I have to tell you, it does smell good. It smells like alfalfa fields. 
this is going to be a long-term care option that's going to keep your roses starting at a reasonable pace and continuing at a reasonable pace. Because here in our area, um, what do we have? Not two blooming times, but something like 95, right? Finally, in the winter, we have to call it and prune that rose because he's never going to stop because our winters are mild. So we need the food to be mild, all right? Azomite is another thing that you might want to consider. It's not so much a food as it is another mineral. So if you have clay soils, there are a lot of minerals that are in there that your plants need and depend on. And sometimes we need to add some more. If you find that you have some Oh gosh, micronutrient deficiencies, this might be the answer. And a little bit later, I'm gonna show you how to recognize what a micronutrient deficiency looks like so that you can then treat it. Earthworm casting, so compost, wood chips, and earthworm castings. So compost, for example, provides about 20% of your plant's nutritional needs. The other 80% of compost job is to improve soil tilth, how it holds water, lets it through at a responsible rate and holds at a responsible rate. Earthworm castings, you can flip that. It's about 80% nutritional value, yet completely organic and not in the political sense, but in the long-term steady release sense. Further, it also invites all the right fungi, bacteria and insect world and it feeds your plants in a way that even organic fertilizers can't. The root growth is astounding, and you're gonna see a huge difference in how big the plant gets without getting wildly big. We don't want it taking over the sidewalk or you suddenly have to park in the next neighborhood, but you're gonna see a real difference. And if you have pH problems, which we'll talk about a little bit more when we get to micronutrient deficiencies, uh, earthworm castings is another way to moderate and keep reasonable your pH levels. There's usually dry fertilizers and liquid fertilizers. The liquid fertilizers often need to be applied more often. The numbers are even lower than the dry, so you might have to apply it more often, but it's usually a little bit easier too. So if you have the dry um, organic fertilizer, and like me, you're not as keen about bending over all the time. With the liquid, you can put it in your little pouring container, your water can, and just pour it where it needs to go, as opposed to getting into the soil and digging in that organic fertilizer a few inches beneath the surface. But you can always count on the organic to do a beautiful job. Um, the only caution I have, is if it says fish in there, you might wanna smell it at the store before you bring it home. If you have cats or you don't wanna invite any uh, obnoxious quadrupeds, look for the ones that don't smell quite as interesting, all right? Let's talk for a minute about watering. And I know this is all about pests and diseases and problems with roses, but it always comes back to how did we water? How did we feed? And this is critical. What we're finding is that when we water, we tend to water this deep. And that means your root zone is exactly that deep, which means when August comes along, that's his total water storage. But a rose's root zone should be one, two, or three or more feet deep, which means every time you water, you have to water that whole distance. And you never water again till you stick your finger in the soil and the soil is really very dry, three to four inches. Now, where the water is applied makes a big difference. So that inner white circle on top of the green canopy, let's pretend that's the original pot that you brought home your plant in. Maybe it's a one gallon pot. And of course, you're not putting that pot in the ground, you're putting the plant in the ground but you're going to kind of remember where that original pot line was. And that's where you focus your watering, not at the trunk. 
but at that original pot line. So if you're using drip emitters and it's a one gallon plant, you're gonna put one emitter here and one emitter here. Then you're gonna turn your, your emitters on, run them for a doubt, about 10 minutes, turn them off for about an hour, stick your finger in that dirt and see how far that water went in 10 minutes. If it's clay, it went about a half an inch. If it's light sandy, it might've gone three inches but you need to go at least 12. So now that you know that you went down, for example, that half an inch or that one inch in 10 minutes, now you can do your arithmetic. If you need to go down the 12 inches, how long do you need to leave it on? 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. It could be anywhere for a brand new plant of a one gallon size from a half an hour to two hours, depending on your soil type. Drip is that slow. In exchange, however, when you feed, that, when you water that plant for the whole distance, it does not need you every day. It needs to be watered a lot less often. It might be 105 out there, but right underneath the soil, it's gonna be down to 75, 65 degrees. It's not the same underneath the surface as it is above. Then let's look at the outer edge of that plant. After six months, your plant is no longer thirsty or hungry. At the original pot line, it's now thirsty and hungry at the furthest reaches of the branches. So drip goes at the drip edge. And if you have established plants, plants that you've had for years or decades, you might need to start watering a lot longer than you did before. If they always managed on a two hour cycle before, once a week, it could be that because the water table keeps going lower and lower as a result of extended droughts, it can't find water at that level anymore. You might need to water three hours. You might need to water four hours to get that distance because he's no longer able to find the water table the way he used to. So here's something that's common. They've got a water emitter right up there against the trunk. And that's not where that little guy is thirsty. And in fact, it's now making that trunk wet, which is inviting rot. So remember, you've got two stages. When it's brand new, put water right at the existing pot line. Six months later, always at the furthest reaches of the branches. After that, every year, two or three, you might have to adjust again as the plant gets larger. They did just announce today, I think, that for sprinklers, you're limited to two days a week. However, for drip, there is no limit. The difference between how much water a sprinkler puts out and how much water a dripper puts out is so huge and so significant that there are no restrictions on drip. Still, make sure in your area that your water company or your water provider has told you when you're allowed to water and make the best use of the water that you have. So if at all possible when shopping for new roses or you have some roses that just weren't making it and you had to let them go and you're ready to find some new ones, there are tags on the roses at the nursery and they will say if they are known to be resistant to certain diseases. So big ones might be powdery mildew or black spot or rust maybe, but take advantage of that tag on the plant itself at the nursery and look for any information that's gonna tell you. So if you had a plant that didn't make it and you know why, write that down and take that with you so you can know to avoid that same plant or I'm sorry, that same disease. Constantly cleaning up a little bit. Okay, so again, the roses aren't needy, but they do want a little bit of attention because they are constantly making new flowers, right? So there's always deadheading the roses. As a rose starts to fade, you're going to prune off that rose and not let it sit right on the ground underneath. You'll probably wanna put it in your compost. However, you're also always gonna occasionally take, always gonna occasionally, you're gonna occasionally take a look in there and see if there are any dead, diseased or damaged branches and likewise remove those. 
the rules for pruning roses are vastly different than anything else. Roses can take a lot more activity and a lot more pruning and fussing with than a lot of other plants can, but still we're gonna be as selective as possible. When you see a diseased leaf, you're probably gonna to wanna to remove that so it doesn't spread. However, know that the hallmark of a disease, by the way, on a leaf will be a circle. If it's kind of blotchy or oddly shaped, it might not be a disease. Most diseases are really very circular. And then there's a halo of red or orange or sometimes a yellow orange at the edge of that circle. And sometimes that diseased bit, the disease will pass, it will go away, but that little brown bit will desiccate and fall out, leaving you with a hole in the leaf. And that's when we start to worry that we had some insect damage but it was probably just an old bit of disease and it passed. One of the things that's really big with roses, and you're gonna see it again and again, is we're gonna prune for airflow. Roses are fat, hardy guys. They are full of leaves and sometimes the leaves are really large. And what that means is that it's constantly slowing down the path of air. And when air circulation is suppressed and slowed down, diseases flourish, especially if you do overhead watering. So every now and again, go out there and there's gonna be these little pencil thin jobbies and you're gonna prune those out to increase the airflow. You're also going to invite the beneficial insects and pollinators and all those other guys. Now here's where it gets difficult, right? How do we know that's a good guy and how do we know if that's a bad guy? In general, let me say this again, Roses do attract certain pests, but time and again, it's been shown that they tend to last about two weeks and then they're gone. And if they last longer, it's because we've taken out the beneficial insects. It's because we've relied on synthetic fertilizers that push a huge amount of tender green growth that invites especially aphids or that we're watering near the trunk and not at the furthest reaches. So let's flip the thinking. Of the whole insect world, 90% are beneficial. Of that 10%, only 2% have the potential to cause any problems. And that 2% only cause problems for about two weeks. Roses are tough. They can usually take it. And if it lasts longer than those two weeks, that's when we're going to look at how we're taking care of the rose. So one of the things that you get to look at is the, and I think it's on the OWL site. If not, it's going to be on one of the things we have towards the end. There is a huge number of insects out there. Like look at that soldier beetle. He's got a red head and a black body. He looks like a nightmare. He is not a nightmare. This is a soldier you want. They are going to eat aphids like there's no tomorrow. We're all familiar with the lady beetle, but if you look at the green lacewing over here, he's got that alligatory shape. The larval form of the lady beetle has that same alligator look, except with red and black, and it's terrifying at first. When I worked in a nursery, people would bring me a bag of them and say, help me, what is this? I've, I've been paying the kids a penny a piece to kill them. It turns out that just like in our species, the larva form of the lacewing and the lady beetle eat way more than we do. So don't assume it's a bad guy. We're gonna look at the damage and we're gonna assess and find out if it's temporary or if it points to some ongoing issue. And if we do need a pesticide or an herbicide, but pesticides and herbicides are not gonna be our first stop in this case. Surround your roses, surround your yard, surround your garden with all types of flowering plants. When you have different colors, different petal types, different bloom times, you are inviting beneficial insects all year round. So to digress for a moment, if you had trouble with your vegetable garden last year and you didn't get as many veggies as you were hoping for, it could be that we weren't inviting the beneficial insects soon enough and getting, um, Oh gosh, lavender. 
for example, a lavender plant planted within five feet, six feet of your garden or your roses will be one of the first things that's going to start inviting those beneficial insects. And we don't want just one type of beneficial insect at one time of the year. We want beneficial insects all year long and for all the plants. So when you buy those uh, flowering plants that have the little tubular bell on them, the flower shapes, those are gonna invite the hummingbirds. When you have those tiny little micro massy tiny flowers, you're gonna invite all different other kinds of beneficials. So get a little wild, get a little adventurous, get different plants that flower at different times and you're gonna have everybody patrolling and working your yard for you. Then sometimes we look at things and we're like, well, okay, like that soldier beetle, right? He just looked awful. This is um, the surfeit fly larval. You see that larva, you see that kind of slimy caterpillary looking guy there? He's munching on the aphids. So don't panic, always take a step back, consider taking a picture of it, doing a Google search. And if you're really not sure, of course, you're always welcome to send an email to me and I'm gonna help you identify who this is. Just keep remembering that 90% of the insect world is fine. For example, here's a caterpillar. Most of us have done a good job of paying attention lately that this is the monarch caterpillar. And something that's been happening a lot in the last few years in the plant nursery is we're getting people coming in in June and July going, I've got caterpillar damage all over my plants. Forgetting that they planted a butterfly garden and they invited the monarchs. And this devastation is exactly what you were hoping to see. You need that world to chomp on your plants occasionally to encourage your plants to be well and to get the beneficial insects that you're looking for. So it, we're finding more and more, and we used to be a little more gentle about this, but we're getting a tiny bit more aggressive. Pesticides should not be your first option. Finding out who it is, when it lives there, and if it's short term is your first option. Let's find out what's going on checking on our irrigation, checking on our fertilizer, pruning for more air circulation. Anytime you go to the nursery and you are ready to get a pesticide, we talk a lot about something called neonicotinoids. And these are known for killing bees and they do it with the tiniest amount of a pesticide. And if you look at these products, at least two of them here, they're showing pictures of flowers on them. Neonicotinoids will kill bees as well as a lot of them also kill earthworms and just about everything else they can get their mitts on. Rather than memorizing these words of the common neonicotinoid active ingredients, if you see a product that says it's going to last you're most likely looking at a neonicotinoid. If you're looking at a product that says, add it to water and add it to soil, you're probably looking at a neonicotinoid. So some of these are sold to last for a year, for example. And a lot of people buy them to control aphids on crepe myrtles and roses, plants that flower. And these products last often at least a year, but the half-life is actually a year, meaning it will last two or three. Continuing to remove all the beneficial insects. And why is that a problem? It turns out that if only 2% of the insect world is a population, but we got is a problem, but we got rid of all the guys that eat the problems, all we have left are problems. So spider mites are hugely on the rise. Aphids, that should just last a few weeks, are lasting 10 months. We need to target a lot closer and we need to be willing to accept some damage. All right. When we use these pesticides, there always is a last resort. Look for the blue tag that are in many of the stores saying less toxic. Look for a product that says it's organic and follow the label. Now, this is surprising. 
it turns out we're not very good at reading the label. So if we have a problem with our rows and we go to the nursery or we go to our garage and we find every product in there that has a picture of a flower on it and just dump it on there, we haven't done a very good job because every pesticide that we release, if we don't give it the right job to do, it becomes a renegade and find something else to do. And it's not what you wanted it to do. So follow the label directions, particularly when you're mixing. So if it says one ounce to the gallon and you think, well, a little extra drop, that, that won't hurt anything. And in fact, it'll probably help. The truth is that extra drop will not help and often will not work at all. There's a reason they say one or two or three ounces to the gallon. It's because that what works. If you do more, it does not work. When know your pest, only target that pest, spot apply. Now, this one's fun. If you have aphids on your rows and it's that one rose, you think, well, I'm going to take care of that. Well, I don't have aphids on the rose next to it. Should I spray that one too? And the answer is absolutely not. Most insects are plant specific. Further, they might even be plant species or type specific. So if you have aphids on rose B, let's call them Barney, and rose A, Alice doesn't have any aphids, don't spray Alice. Barney has his own aphids. We're just gonna take care of Barney. Avoid spraying when they're in bloom. Generally, we ask you to spray in the evening when all the bees have gone to sleep. And organic or not, lex toxic or not, all these products are meant to kill, harm, dissuade, and they can have an effect on you. So wearing your gloves, closed-toed shoes, goggles if needed. Timing is important if releasing beneficials. So this one is always fun. People have a, a handful of ladybugs that they're buying and then they also have a pesticide and they wonder which one they should do first. So if you put the uh, lady beetles out first and then spray, you might've killed the lady beetles. So instead, let's spray off the tree or the rose, get off all those aphids, let it dry off and then release the lady beetles, okay? So here we go. Let's look at some of the main problems roses tend to have and how to handle them in this IPM friendly manner. And here's where it gets boring. Looky there, aphids increase when you are feeding with a synthetic fertilizer. Synthetic fertilizers push a lot of tender new green growth, which means you have aphids all the time. You've got to let those leaves harden off with excessive pruning habits because pruning induces new growth. So if you're constantly mowing and farting with this thing, he's constantly putting out new leaves, which invite the aphids. Ants are an indicator. Ants are beautiful for the soil. We need to start enjoying them a little bit more than we do. However, if the ants are going up into the rows, chances are they're bringing in aphids, tending the aphids, fighting off aphid predators, and actually farming the aphids for the sweet, sticky honeydew that aphids make. So as much enjoyment and purpose as we have and appreciate for ants, they don't belong going up your trees or your roses. And in that case, you need to put a stop to it. And usually we recommend baits. We're looking at baits where one ant is gonna take it back home to share with the entire colony, we're also going to pull the mulch and leaf litter away from the base of the plant because when you have that mulch right there, it's a covered, secure, safe highway for every insect on this planet to walk unchecked into your plant. Make it harder for these guys to start infesting you and move them back and lack of predators. So white flies, uh, overwatering, poor drainage, Oh, there it is. They increase when feeding with synthetic fertilizers. And there it is again, lack of predators. So when you have white flies, you're going to find out why you have white flies. All right. And you're going to address that. So you have white flies for a week or two, not six months. Western flower thrips. You're going to see this characteristic stippling on the leaf. It 
kind of looks like when you look at a TV screen really, really close. And that's also a familiar, similar to um, mites, okay, that characteristic stippling. And they might cause some damage or distortion to the buds or even the flowers. And we're back at it. Irrigation is too much or too little, or I would say at the wrong space next to the trunk, not at the furthest reaches. Feeding with synthetic fertilizers that force rapid growth, that these early spring guys are finding food all season long, maybe even all year long, and lack of predators. Spider mites, there they are. See, it's that same kind of stippling business. Poor air circulation, dry, dusty conditions. So air circulation, pruning out those pencil thin jobs that aren't gonna really support a nice looking rose to increase the air circulation. Make sure you have mulch down. When it's just bare soil, it's dry, it's dusty, and it encourages mites. Using broader spectrum pesticides that take away everybody that would eat a mite. And which is of course, leads to lack of predators. Rose slugs, saw flies, these are super common. And what you're gonna see on the left-hand bottom part of the picture is what's called window painting. So these guys do not make holes in the leaves. They make window painting where they're taking out the tender little bits and leaving just the veins behind. This is a very small problem. It looks horrible to us, we're very concerned, but remember, roses are amazing at making new leaf material. They love making new flowers. You can selectively prune off those bits and get rid of them. And you're gonna have new leaves that are gonna look just fine. If you fed and watered it at the furthest reaches, you stuck to organics and you put mulch down, your plant is gonna withstand this two to three week problem and recover just fine. Hoplia beetles. This little guy loves to show up about the first week of May and he harasses the petals of the roses. And get this, this guy only harasses the petals of very light colored roses. Dark roses are not affected. And he's also kind of oogie looking. We don't really appreciate the way he looks. He lasts for two weeks, your roses can handle it. If it becomes insane or you just really don't like it, maybe you've got these roses planned for a wedding or something, make use of the fact that this guy loves light colors and you put out a white colored bucket, you put some water down in the bottom, this guy's gonna march right into it. And the slick sides of the bucket deny him the ability to get any purchase and crawl out. Two weeks, harasses the edges, light colored flowers. Black spot and rust, very common when the air circulation has been tamped down, very common when we do overhead watering and we just need to remove those leaves. When you do your winter pruning, your heavy duty pruning, by the way, it's often if you had black spot and things like that, go ahead and get rid of those leaf material too. Probably don't put them in your compost, maybe put them in the green waste bin instead. Powdery mildew, another short timer. This guy loves warm, dry weather and he tends to show up between 60 and 80 degrees. So as soon as you get these new lovely leaves on your roses, you start getting this dusting of talcum powder, powdery mildew all over it too because the temperature is just right. And what do we know about temperature? It's Temporary, that's not going to last. However, the best thing to do with powdery mildew, it turns out is splash it off with the hose. If you do need to get some control for it, copper works especially well. Neem oil can also work well. Okay, I'm gonna spend just one more mi extra minute here on rose mosaic virus. So there is no cure, but it only leads to um, a slowness of vigor. Best we can tell, this only occurs on roses that have been grafted. It does not seem to travel very quickly or easily or rarely 
to your other roses. However, as the yellowing continues, the leaf becomes less and less green, which is decreasing its ability to photosynthesize, which is what leads to the decrease in vigor. The university has made no recommendations that you can't then plant another rose there, but there are some real thoughts that maybe you should remove that rose. Now, let's suppose though, this is a rose you just love and adore. You might want to, during the winter, transplant it to another area of the yard where it's not near your roses. It is not curable, but it's not horribly serious. It's not horribly quick, but the more yellow that leaf gets, the less he can photosynthesize and take care of himself. And the yellow is very different from problems with food and water, too much or too little. That tends to be just general blanket yellow or a micronutrient deficiency. That's when the leaf is yellow, but the veins are still green. And usually that's zinc, magnesium, or iron. But before you buy zinc, magnesium, or iron for a micronutrient deficiency, what you really need is a pH meter to make sure that your soil pH is not way past seven or way below six, because when the pH is really off, it doesn't matter what you add to the soil, the pH is off and will not allow the plant to access or uptake anything that you give it when the pH is too far off. This is something called rose rosette disease. Occasionally it's called witching where the um, leaves, well, they become needle-like. They're no longer round. They never get fat. They might be a little bit um, pale green. And this is another disease that is not considered curable and removing the plant is definitely recommended. And in this case, uh, you probably even want to wash the clippers that you use to take it down with. And I want to show you this next slide, though, for a moment. This is herbicide damage, and it looks a bunch like rose rosette disease. You can see that those leaves have become very needle-like. And this is from herbicide drift. And sometimes it won't show up till a year or a year and a half after the herbicide was used or maybe somebody used an herbicide um, a couple of houses over or next door, and this can happen. Go ahead and prune that stuff out and take care of how you water and feed so he can recover. And of course, there's all these online resources. Oh, 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 and I wanna show you anything organic or not never goes in the water, people. It goes to the household hazardous waste. We've got some more coming up for you. And of course, feel free to write to me at any time using that email address. And Lorenzo, do we have some questions we need to take care of? The one question was uh, sort of specific to older roses okay. and whether all the leaves should be pruned off uh, every year. So if you're looking at that annual taking down of the roses, the truth is, um, so he never goes completely dormant in our area and there are some leaves that are hanging on. When you do your serious winter pruning, those leaves will be removed. Any leaves that are down on the ground, if you didn't have diseases, I say leave those leaves there. That's a normal part of the cycle of feeding the soil. It breaks down and everything's good. All right. Do we have yeah, another That's one? a great point that, um, you know, leaf mulch, Yes. If it's undiseased leaves is a wonderful natural mulch that whichever plant it comes from deposited there, you know, for, for, for a reason. It did. I mean, roses have been making it, all plants, right? Have been making it forever without us. Mm -hmm. Nobody came along and plugged in the blower and got rid of the forest leaf litter, right? <laughs> the forest needed to use it. Our plants need to use it. And if there's not a problem, leave it there. Uh, are there any other questions that uh, people would like to have answered? So we're looking pretty good, huh? Yeah, that was a really comprehensive everything you need to know about roses. So thank you, Julie. Oh, gosh, you are Thanks so everyone for joining. Please know that we'll be sending you a notification of where you can access the recording. 
and always feel free to look at our water, our world. It's a great way to introduce yourself to integrated pest management without getting boggled down. And we're always here for you. Thank you so much for being here. And we hope to see you at the next webinar. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you.